if you were to if you were to uh, answer what do you think the greatest measure of maturity is what would you say if you were to think of many different Christian virtues and you were to try to measure those different virtues and say which one is the best indication of maturity what would you say well the Bible in chapter 3 of the book of James says for we all stumble in many ways and I probably could get a few amens out there for that and then it says if anyone does not stumble in what he says he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well so we might say what would be a measurement of spiritual maturity I think one of the measurements would be the ability to control what we say it says he is a perfect man now obviously the Bible in other places says if we say we ha if we say we have no sin we are a liar and the truth is not in us so we're not saying he's absolutely perfect but we are saying he's mature but you know the book of James doesn't stop there in chapter 1 it says this you know my beloved brethren but let everyone be quick to hear slow to speak and slow to anger for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God so not only controlling our speech but also it says controlling our anger is a great measurement of spiritual maturity so how would we define how would we describe how would we say somebody who is spiritually mature what would they look like what would they be like and I think we would say they would be someone who could control what they said and we would say they would be someone who could control their anger now there's a book in the or there's a verse in the book of Proverbs it's kind of an interesting verse it says in chapter 16 he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city he's saying that someone who can rule his spirit who can control his spirit is mighty and greater than one who can capture a city in the sense of being a warrior or a successful warrior in that context so could we expand it a little bit to say spiritual maturity is seen in self-control now we've been studying here some passages about the Christian life and we've said we can't do it on our own but these are things through the Holy Spirit that God wants us to do in 2nd Peter he says he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that you may become partakers of the divine nature so he says when you've trusted in Christ God gives you a new nature then he goes on to say there as a result of that apply diligence and then he says in your faith supply moral excellence and then in your moral excellence he says supply knowledge and then with your knowledge he says supply self-control and that's what I want us to talk about this morning self-control self-control I think that's a measure of maturity that's a goal that we should aspire to it should be we might think about speech control we might think about anger control we might think about there's so many different ways where we need to show self-control and self-control is a measure of maturity as the proverb says he's mightier than one who uh, captures a city is the person who shows self-control well where would we go to find an example of that I think one of the best examples is in the Old Testament in 1st Samuel chapter 24 so turn there if you would 1st Samuel chapter 24 I want us to see a picture of self-control now the passage deals with King David but David had not yet become king if you remember in the history of Israel that David was a young man he ministered to Saul who was the king but Saul disobeyed on several occasions Samuel the prophet told Saul to wait seven days to offer the offering but he didn't wait the seven days and he disobeyed God the Samuel Samuel the prophet told Saul to kill all the Amalekites and to kill King Agag but Saul didn't obey God 
And so Saul, in a sense, forfeited the kingdom because of his disobedience. Well, in the meantime, though, Israel fought the Philistines. And at that time, David killed Goliath. You remember the famous passage, even as a young teenager, David went out and killed Goliath. And at that time, he became quite a person in Israel. And God told the prophet Samuel to anoint someone else other than Saul to be king. And Samuel secretly anointed David. David was going to be the next king of Israel, even though Saul was still alive. And then Samuel, well, David faithfully served Saul. And David won battles for Saul. And in the process, Saul became jealous of David. And, and, and several times, Saul tried to kill David. Even when David was ministering to him, he threw a spear and tried to kill him that way. On another occasion, he threw a spear and tried to kill him again. On another occasion, he sent soldiers to David's house and tried to kill him. And it says, Saul finally pursued David with his soldiers and daily tried to kill David. And that's the context that David has been faithful to Saul and Saul has departed from the Lord and Saul wants to kill David. Now Saul was anointed by the Lord to be king, but he forfeited the kingdom, but it had not yet been taken away from him. David had been anointed by the Lord to be king, but he had not yet begun to assume the kingship. And that's the setting. And so David is a man on the run. David is a fugitive. And Saul is seeking him and wanting to kill him, and he pursues him every day. Well, look in verse 1. Now, when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. So you see, there were people in Israel who delivered up David, who gave Saul information about David. David had done nothing wrong to them. David actually helped the people that he was around. But they still gave Saul information and said, David is by En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David. And it says, and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Sounds kind of funny to us, but the idea here is that Saul with his 3,000 men was pursuing David. And yet along the way in that area, he went into the cave. Maybe we might call it a rest stop or something like that. But Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the recesses of the cave. What an amazing circumstance. And it says in verse 4, the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. His men said, David, this providential act of God is unmistakable, that God has clearly delivered Saul up to you. And this is the day that God said he would deliver your enemies into your hands. Now, as I've read through 1 Samuel, I can't find a passage where this was ever said. I can't find a passage where it specifically says that God was going to deliver up David's enemies into his hand. Now, God was speaking through Samuel in the implication that God would prosper David, that God would bless David. That's clearly there. But there's not that I can find a specific passage. So the friends say something here that sounds kind of right, but not exactly right. The idea is that God's going to watch over and bless David. That's true. But there's not a specific place that I have found where this particular quote is given. Again, they said, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Now, even Jonathan, Saul's son, said to David, You'll be king. And Saul's son, Jonathan, said to David, you know, the Lord's going to prosper you. But there is no passage that I can find that says what they said. And so even though the general sentiment of what they said is basically true, there is no passage where the Lord specifically said that. And that's probably important.
because sometimes people will claim to quote scripture and it won't be scripture. Well, let's see what happens next. Then David arose and secretly cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. So it's likely that Saul took off a robe, set it to the side, and David cut off a bit of his robe. It came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him. Well, that's worth taking note of, that David had a conscience. And you know, the Bible says that every man has a conscience. And David had a conscience, and his conscience bothered him. It says his conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord. Now what underlies all of David's behavior? Because of the Lord. Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. And so what is David saying here? David is saying that God has anointed Saul to be king and I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. I won't do it. And then in verse 7, David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. You know, it would have been easy for David to say, well, I'm not going to do anything, but, you know, if you guys want to do something, that's all right with me. I mean, who am I to impose my morals on someone else? We hear that sometimes, don't we? Oh, so he here says, no. And he does not allow his men to hurt Saul, the Lord's anointed. And Saul arose and left the cave and went on his way. Now, we could at some point say, well, this, this is the end of the story. And David did good, and he did do good, but the story goes on, because now David, though, is going to go a step further and talk to the person that he's involved with. Now, afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men saying, behold, David seeks to harm you. Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Now, my father, see, indeed, see the edge of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you. Know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands. And I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. And now in verse 12, David raises the we might say the audience, because now he appeals to God, not just to Saul. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. And I think the point of quoting that proverb is to say, I have done no wickedness, therefore I'm not wicked. I'm not the one that's doing wickedness. And it's proven today. The proof is in the robe, the edge, to show that you were delivered up, that God set you right before me, and I wouldn't stretch forth my hand against you. After what has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A single flea? In other words, David says, I'm insignificant. You're the king of Israel, and you've got 3,000 men, and you're pursuing me. I'm like a, a single flea. I'm a dead dog in comparison. 
The Lord therefore be judge and decide between you and me. And may he see and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Well, what will Saul do? When David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? Then David, excuse me, then Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Isn't that interesting that Saul, who's dead set in doing wrong at this point, was touched by David's righteousness. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I. For you have dealt well with me, while I have dealt wickedly with you. You have declared today that you have done good to me, that the Lord delivered me into your hand, and you did not kill me. David said the Lord did it. Saul said the Lord did it. David's men said the Lord did it. There was an unmistakable providential work of God where he delivered up Saul into David's hand. And yet David did not raise his hand against Saul. It says in verse 19, For if a man finds his enemy, will he, will he let him go away safely? May the Lord therefore reward you with good in return for what you have done to me this day. So Saul in effect blesses David and calls upon God to bless David for what David has done. Now behold, I know that you will surely be king, and that the true or that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. And then an unusual request, Saul, who appealed to David, says, So now swear to me by the Lord. Now Saul doesn't directly talk to the Lord, but he appeals to David. David appealed to the Lord. But Saul says, swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut, not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's household. So Saul can see that God will elevate David and he prays that God would not destroy all of Saul's offspring when Saul is gone. And David swore to Saul. And then it says, and Saul went to his home. But I think with significance it says, and his men, but David and his men went to the stronghold. Why didn't he go back with Saul? I don't think he still trusts Saul. And he has good reason not to. Because Saul will try to kill him again. But as we study this passage... What do we see here? We see that David has a remarkable self-control. We see that Saul is a man who had consistently done him wrong. We see that David had done no wrong. We see that everybody agrees that this was providentially ordained and orchestrated that David and his men are hiding in a cave that Saul has 3,000 soldiers. But Saul singly goes into the cave and is delivered up. And it would be very easy for David to kill him. And if David didn't want to kill him, he had several friends that would have been very happy to do that for David. And yet David doesn't do that. And notice he, he goes against the advice of his friends. He actually goes against the clear providential actions and circumstances that he finds himself in. He goes against the misquoted word that the friend said the Lord had said. The Lord had not exactly said that. Now how does he do that? And why does he do that? Well I think there's some clues in several places in scripture why doesn't he think he should touch the Lord's anointed? And as I study the scripture, there's not a specific verse that says that. But in Exodus chapter 22, verse 28, it says, You shall not curse God, nor curse a ruler of your people. So clearly the word of God, the word of God, not somebody's attempt to quote the word of God, but the word of God itself says... 
you shall not curse a ruler of your people. God had established Israel as a theocracy. God is the one who put kings in place and it was God's job to take them out of place. And he says, you shouldn't even curse a ruler of your people. Now, if you're not supposed to curse a ruler of your people, would it be okay to kill a ruler of your people? And I would say, no. And so David goes against circumstances. He goes against providential circumstances. He goes against the advice of his friends. He goes against the fact that he has been wronged and wronged and wronged again. Because he believes in the Lord, he fears the Lord, and he believes in God's word. There's another passage in Exodus where it says, He who strikes father or his mother... He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now clearly Saul wasn't his father, even though I think he called him father. And David wasn't his son, even though Saul calls David his son. But the point is, if it's true with a father and a mother, the idea that Saul's a ruler of the people and is one to be respected. And David then, I think, submits to God's word. I think we can see also, if you look on your handout, we can see that he's obedient to the word. He has faith in the Lord. And there's a clue in chapter 26, because if you read on in 1 Samuel, there's a very similar circumstance that comes about later. Not exactly the same. Maybe that can be your homework this week. Read verse chapter 26. But in chapter 26, a very parallel situation will come about where David could also take Saul's life. And it says in verse 9, David said to one of his soldiers, Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? David also said, as the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him. Or his day will come that he dies, and he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But now please take the spear that is, in his head, that is at his head and the jug of water and let us go. In other words, what David believes is, again, he's not going to take vengeance. That he's not going to stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed. But what does he believe? He believes that God will take care of him. And he believes that if it's God's will for Saul to perish, that Saul will perish. That Saul will go down to battle and he will perish. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. And you know what? David was completely innocent of any wrongdoing. And we could say, what a man sows, that also shall he reap. Because later when David would become king, and there were some who came out from David, even his own son Absalom, that wanted to kill David. But David, God protected. And that didn't happen to him. And so what do we see here? We see this David who, who has such self-control. And where does it come from? And I would say it comes from a faith in the Lord. What you believe affects what you do. That is such a cardinal truth that people don't want to recognize. But what you believe absolutely determines what you do. He believes in the Lord and he also fears the Lord. It says in the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And he's afraid to disobey God, and he has a faith and obedience in God's revealed word, that his word is even greater than circumstances. His word is greater than the advice of his friends. His word is greater than the wrongs that were done to him. And that seems to be that which guides him. Now when we talk about also, we would say he believes that God is a God of justice. And that God one day will right wrongs. That God one day will acquit the innocent. That one day God will judge the wicked if they do not change. There are many verses that teach that. Deuteronomy 35, vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time their foot will slip. 
Psalm 1 or Psalm 58 ends with, with a quote sometimes you hear people say kind of in a funny way. And men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Sometimes somebody who does wrong and something happens to them, somebody will say, surely there is a God. And that's where I think that quote comes from. The idea that God does ultimately judge the wicked. Well, we'd also say, where does this come from? I'd say it comes from the Spirit. Remember in Galatians chapter 5, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. What does he mean by that? He's saying this is the fruit of the Spirit. And isn't it worth noting that the last thing on the list is self-control? I don't think that's because that's the least important thing. We might even argue it's one of the most important things. So self-control, self-control, control how we speak, control our anger. Should it control the things we look at? David says in Psalm 101 verse 3, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. Should it control where we go? If we want to be controlled by the Spirit, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, Self-control is being filled with the Spirit and under control. Being drunk with wine is the opposite of that. As I was thinking about self-control, I was thinking, why do people get out of control? What do you think the number one reason why people get out of control is? And this is just my, my, uh, my opinion. It's funny, when I was re researching for this, I was looking up things on the internet Road rage. I mean, if you want to look up road rage, it's unbelievable the things you can look up out about road rage and how people's lives are just changed in an instant. The rest of their life can be ruined because of lack of self-control in road rage. I mean, kind of on a funny note, people, you know, there was one guy, they called it appliance range, uh, rage, appliance rage. He, he threw his washing machine out of his door down the steps and fired three shots of a gun into it. And the police were called because he was so mad at his washing machine. I've never heard of appliance rage before. I mean, I heard of some people that uh, read about critically injured because of a, a a soda vending machine because they didn't get the right change and, and were shaking the machine and it tipped over on them. Uh, I mean, so you know, it's funny. It's not that it happened, but it is kind of funny to think about. But, but anyway, so why do, why do these things happen? And I would say probably the number one thing I think is anger. Anger has to be pretty high on the list. Anger. But if we believe in God and fear the Lord and obey his word and filled with the spirit, I think God can help us with our anger. And it says, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. It's worth noting in history, Dwight Eisenhower was a young boy who was, had a terrible temper. And he was so angry one day that his parents wouldn't let him do something. He was 10 years old and he started punching a tree, which again, usually you don't come out ahead doing that. And he bloodied up his hands and his mother, well, he, 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 he got spanked and was sent to bed and his mother kind of consoled him and had him memorize one of the verses that we looked at earlier. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. Isn't it interesting that the supreme allied commander at age 10 was memorizing a verse that he who rules his spirit is better than he who captures a city, we might say who captures a continent. In other words, self-control is very important. 
But not only would we say just anger, uh, what else causes problems? Well, I'd go with the Ephesians verse where it talks about do not get drunk with wine. I think oftentimes if you look at the problems people get into, if you look at, at car accidents, how many car accidents are the result of being under the influence? And we could expand that to any kind of a drug that you'd be under the influence. In other words, you're not under control, and yet this is saying that if we want to be mature and wise, we want to be under control. So anger, we could talk about influence of alcohol. We could talk about the influence of friends. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Bad company corrupts good morals. In other words, sometimes the people we're around influence us in a negative way and we need to be careful. We could go on and on. I think, you know, it talks about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Those are all areas where we're vulnerable to. But here he's saying the man of God, the woman of God, is someone who is able to exercise self-control. Now the passage we looked at in the beginning in 2 Peter says, If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to be not useless, if you don't want to be unfruitful, meaning you want to be useful and fruitful, then these qualities need to be ours. And we've talked about diligence, and we've talked about faith, and we've talked about moral excellence, and we've talked about knowledge. And we're talking today about self-control. God can help each one here with self-control if we come to him. Sometimes the beginning of victory is recognizing a problem. If this is a problem, and who isn't it a problem for in some way? Recognize that God can help us with this as we come to his word. And of course, who's the perfect, the greatest example of the one of self-control? Well, we read in Isaiah chapter 53 about the Lord Jesus, and it says about him, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Isn't that interesting? His mouth, his mouth, his mouth was under control. He's the perfect example of self-control in every way. And why did he have such self-control? Why didn't he open his mouth? Because when he went to the cross, he was bearing the sin of the world, and he couldn't complain because the sin of the world was justly being punished. So why was he the one who silently suffered? Because the suffering was necessary, and the suffering was just, not for him, but because he took your sins and suffered in your place. So as we conclude this morning, two things I want you to think about. Self-control yourself, and have you trusted in the one who died in your place and paid your penalty? If you do, the Bible says you're forgiven. If you don't, the Bible says you're not forgiven. And it even goes on to say the wrath of God abides on you. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son, the wrath of God abides on him. It's quite simple. What category do you find yourself in? I would invite you to trust in him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that talks about the Lord Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If there's one here this morning 
who wants their sins taken away, who wants to be forgiven, I invite you to pray with me. Dear God, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's God's son. I believe he's God who became a man. And I believe he died in my place. And I believe he was raised from the dead. And I believe he paid my penalty. And dear God, I trust him as my savior. I trust him that my sins now are forgiven because of what he did. And for those who've trusted him, what about this whole subject of self-control? What would we have done if we were in David's shoes? He didn't listen to his friends. He didn't listen to bad or inaccurate quotes of scripture. He didn't seek what was easiest for him. But he trusted in you, O oh God. And he believed that you are a righteous God who one day will right wrongs. And he was able to delay gratification because he believed in you. And Lord, we pray that you might help us. It's so easy to lose our temper to say things we regret. Let us remember, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Help us, Lord. If there's somebody here with a need, I pray you'd pray with me. God, help me in this area. Help me not to lose my control whether it's because of anger or friends or alcohol or whatever it might be. Help me, oh God. You fill in the blank. Help me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.